Wahid, and I work for uh, APNIC. Um, a pleasure to be here uh, with all of you today. Um, let me introduce the speaker that we have for our session. Uh, he is Matthew Fow from ESET, and the title of his presentation is When HTTP is Not Enough, a Review of Stealthy Command and Control Protocols. Before passing to him, I'd like to remind everybody to put your questions to the Q&A and look forward to your questions and interacting with Matt. Um, so without further ado, over to you, Matt. Your mic is off. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, I hope you're all enjoying this virtual edition of First 2020. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, stealthy command control protocols. And I'm going to use example we encountered during our investigation. So I'm Mathieu Fau, a malware researcher at ESET. My day to day job is to track APTs by leveraging the ESET telemetry. So finding new malware families or uh, unknown uh, malicious campaigns. So in the past few years, I mainly focus on APTs such as Turla and the Duke's APT29. So the plan for today, first I will define what, has, what I call traditional or basic command and control protocol. Then I will give examples of stealthy command and control protocols we've seen in the while. So I've, I will mainly use example of uh, APT's campaign because that's why I'm generally looking at, but it's uh, like applicable to any kind of uh, um, malicious threat actor and you'll see the exact same techniques used, used by firmware actors. Finally, I'll give some ideas of countermeasure or mitigations for the examples uh, I will talk about. So first, traditional command control protocols. I guess that everybody uh, already look at some HTTP or HTTPS-based based command control protocol, where the command control URL is directly hard-coded in the malware sample. So this is a, a basic example from for a malware called Light as Trustful Media that was recently, recently outed by the US Cybercon. So you can see that there is a URL directly encoding the malware sample. So there is any anything like encryption or so if you run this malware in the sandbox, you'll have direct access to the command control protocol uh, URL. Some other malware family use what we call a domain generation algorithm. So it means that the command control domain or URL is not stored anywhere in the malware, but what's in the malware is the algorithm to generate uh, this domain. So generally, this domain, this algorithm uh, take a seed uh, that can be based on the date or, or on an unpredictable value, such as, for example, for the BDEP malware family, they were using a foreign currency exchange rate, so it was not possible to, um, to, to determine what will be the, uh, the, next, uh, the next domains and they can be only register uh, the, the day they will be used. So what's the problem for the attacker with uh, this, this kind of uh, command control protocols? First, they all use domain with no or low reputation. So they are likely to be blocked in corporate environments. Um, even if they are run in a sandbox prior to execution, uh, the sandbox will be able to determine that it's reaching out to, to a very suspicious domain. And even if it's not blocked in the sandbox, if in your telemetry uh, or logs, you see that big amount of data are sent to a an unknown domain, it might raise questions. So uh, I'm going to present uh, some examples uh, that like some techniques attacker use to either bypass sandbox or, uh, or log and telemetry. So uh, first one, uh, I, I will present like the MITRE technique because uh, for like I, I choose three different techniques for today. And 
that Maito did a great job at like summarizing those techniques. So the first one is web service. So it means that um, attackers, they will rely on web service that web service are websites like uh, Facebook, Dropbox, Twitter, uh, anything that can be used legitimately to store data. But as it can be used legitimately to, to store data, it can also be used by malicious threat actor um, as a rel relay uh, between their infrastructure and, and the victim. So from an attacker perspective, first, when the uh, malicious sample is run in a sandbox without, in, without internet access, you will only see connection to um, the, the public service. So the sandbox won't be able to, to realize that um, connection is suspicious. Also, uh, in your logs, you won't see, or well, you will see less communications with low reputation domains. Uh, it will also blame to the network traffic because it's quite usual to to send big amount of data to, to web services such as Dropbox. Obviously, depending on what your typical user is doing, but it can be like they can use Dropbox for their uh, real job. And also, as I said, like some user may need public service for their day-to-day -day job. So it might, those services might be hard to block uh, in a corporate environment. First example with the winning key group. So this first set of examples, they are aimed at by, bypassing sandbox. So in the end, the, the, the malware sample will still reach out to a, to a domain under the control of the attacker. So first example is with WinNTI, also known as APT41, and they are well known for the compromise of gaming companies, also uh, supply chain attacks. And they tend to use public services such as Google Docs. For example, this is a Google Docs they use, and it will extract part of this uh, uh, fake uh, uh, SSH key. And this, so this, this is what will be extracted, and then it will be decrypted, and it's uh, URL. So if you run this sample in a sandbox without internet access, it will still just, it will just reach out to Google Docs. Next example uh, with Turla and their in, uh, Firefox extension that was reaching out to, uh, to Instagram. So they use the official uh, Instagram of uh, Britney Spears. They included a, a message. But if we look at the source code, we actually can see that uh, there is some suspicious characters. Um, and these characters will be used to reconstruct the URL to a bit.ly uh, uh, link. And this is, uh, it, will be, it will redirect to the final command control server. So again, if running to a sandbox, you will see only a connection to a brief Nespier installer. Last example of this set is with a Polyclot Duke, which is a third stage downloader used by the Dukes or APT29. Um, why polyglot? It's because they use uncommon character encodings and they put that on public services such as Twitter, Reddit, and the main difference uh, from the two previous examples is that in the same malware sample, they will include links to three different uh, public services. So for, for example, one Reddit link, one Twitter link, one MGU link. So if one of them in, is blocked uh, in the uh, uh, victim network, it is likely that at least uh, one or two of the other will still work. So it is actually a quite good method to bypass um, the uh, as block of very specific uh, public service. So this is an example on Reddit. So you can see there is a, this uh, very weird, weird encoding, and it actually decodes to the final URL. Uh, we can see same thing on Twitter, and it will also decode to a, to a final URL. So, as I said, this example is aimed to bypass sandbox, but we also have example with a bidirectional communication with a, with public service. This is, for example, Newpass, which is a malware family that is probably operated by the Dukes, 
even if it was first attributed to Turla. And it, use, it uses Imgur to receive command and send data. So there is uh, no contact to, to, uh, to a server controlled by the attacker. How does it work? It uses teleography, so the backdoor uh, for exploitation, the backdoor encodes in picture some data and then use uh, the uh, HTTP API to upload it to Imgur. And in the other way around, uh, attackers are uploading uh, picture with uh, commands encoded in it, in them uh, to Imgur, and then the new pass backdoor with, will download those picture, decode them, and execute the command. So in that case, it's very different to the three last example because Imgur will act as a proxy between the victim network and attacker control network resources. Last example, uh, with Scratch, which is a backdoor used by Turla and they use, they use it mainly to extract documents. And what's better than Dropbox to extract documents? And um, in that case, they will use the HTTP, official HTTP API of, of Dropbox to, to upload uh, archives containing stolen documents. And this archive can be then uh, uh, retrieved by the Turla operators from Dropbox. But from the Defender perspective, you'll see only connection to Dropbox as you don't have access to the, to the side between Dropbox and uh, Turla control net network infrastructure. And in the same way, they will upload comments to the Dropbox seconds. And these comments are then downloaded from directly from Dropbox by the Crutch backdoor. So we can say that Dropbox is a proxy between Crutch and Tura. Now, second uh, technique with uh, May protocols. And this is some, something uh, we have seen an increase in use, especially with the uh, Tura threat actor. So they are really relying a lot on, uh, on emails as common control uh, protocol in the past two, two or three years. Because I guess uh, security products or defender made a lot of effort to block uh, HTTP based uh, protocols. So to be stealthy, they had to, to to level up their, their, their techniques. First, emails are generally well monitored for spam or phishing, but they are not monitored a lot for, uh, for use as common control protocol. Also, it is common to send big amount of data by email because people in their day-to-day -day job, people routinely send documents, big documents, to people outside of their organization. First example for this technique is Tura Lac Neuron. This is a custom malware for Microsoft Exchange. So Microsoft Exchange is the on-premise uh, mail server uh, of Microsoft. And it acts as a transport agent. Transport agent is a feature of Microsoft Exchange. It's a kind of plugging system. And it's generally used by anti-spam products. So it allows a full access to the, to the mail traffic and it allows to set up callbacks on events such as when an email is received or when an email is sent. So this is how it works. Yeah, it's very complicated, but uh, what you have to, to retain is that uh, Lightning is plugged in very specific uh, place of, uh, of exchange, and it allows to see, uh, like for example, when there is SMTP events, or also when an email goes through the mail server. So you have a Microsoft Exchange server infected with Light Neuron. Uh, every time an email is sent or received by this mail server, it, uh, Light Neuron will be called. It will be able to, to process the email. So there is two functionality in Light Neuron. First, it can modify email. So for example, it is able to change the attachments or change the subject. And changing the attachment is kind of powerful because you can add some zero day in, in, a, in, a, in a document, existing document, for example. But what interests us in that case is the backdoor functionality. 
So it can execute comments that are received by, uh, by email. And uh, so this is an example. So this is an uh, uh, email that is uh, created by Lightning to exfiltrate data. So as this is an example, this is a picture I, I chose. This is not the real picture uh, Tiola operators are using, but this was created by Lightning and it is sent back to, to the operator. As you can see, like everything looks kind of legit because they use steganography to, to hide data in the, in the PDF documents. So the PDF is still valid. And it just uh, uh, co comments they are received by the mail server and then block. So the email is not delivered to the final recipient. And it's the same for the, the extracted data. It, it is, uh, the email is sent from any email address of the, of the Exchange server, but it is actually not visible by the end user. So it's very hard to, to notice that uh, the Exchange server is used as the main uh, pivot point between the external network and the compromise organization. Second example is with the Tula Outlook backdoor, also known as Facade. It's similar to like Neuron, but instead of working on the server, is working on uh, Microsoft Outlook main client, so only on one victim machine. So it, it's a bit less stealthy because the email will still go through the organization exchange server and will be delivered to the main clients. It leverage uh, the MAPI messaging application programming interface, which is an official API to, to interact with Microsoft Outlook and manage emails. Same way as Lightroom, comments are received in PDF, PDF attachment and data is sent back also by PDF attachment. So let's imagine that a Chola operator sends a specially crafted email attachment to the email address of the, uh, of the target. So this is not how uh, the, the, the victim is compromised. It, the victim has always been, was compromised before, is the outlook is, is compromised, and then the Tiola operator sends a spe special email to trigger the backdoor functionality of, uh, of the backdoor. Then the specially crafted PDF attachment is extracted. Uh, it, uh, the backdoor will uncover the, the bytes, decrypt them, and the command is executed. So this is a passive backdoor in the sense that it doesn't reach out to a, to a CNC server, but this is the operator that is reach, reaching out to the victim. Last example with a Comrade version 3, which is another backdoor operated by Tiola. And this is a mix between the technique I presented earlier, the public service, and emails because it will use the Gmail web interface to uh, receive comments and also extract data by email. It, uh, it uses the web UI, so it embeds the HTML parser to, to parse the inbox and also the emails, etc. So generally, uh, a Tiola operator you, uses a another mailbox on a other free mail provider such as JMX to send an email with a specially crafted attachment. Then on the other side, Comrade will reach out to, to the same uh, uh, dedicated mailbox. So these mailboxes are under the full control of the attacker and they are not compromised mailboxes. So it will connect to the Gmail web UI, then parse the HTML of the mailbox, download the email attachment, decrypt the attachment, and in the attachment, there is comments, and then it executes the comments and send back the, the result by composing uh, a message using the Gmail web interface. So this is an example of an email from the attacker. You can see that it was sent from the mx.de to the Gmail uh, address uh, used by Comrades. Um, there is an attachment, the document.xlsx which is actually not an Excel file. This is just the extension, but it's an uh, encrypted raw bytes containing comments. So uh, it's shown in Outlook, but it's just for the sake of the example. Theoretically, it just stay in, uh, in Gmail. And this is kind of tricky to block because there are a lot of people 
who, who tends to, to connect to, to Gmail to consult their, uh, their private email from uh, their corporate computer. Also, attackers that generally uh, register Gmail address using the name of one of the employee of the compromised organization. So even if you, if you have access to the full network traffic and you're checking that this is a, an employee uh, of your organization, you won't realize that it's actually a mailbox controlled by Tiola. Last technique which is DNS. So in a typical organization, there is like a ton of DNS queries. So it's easy to blend to the net network traffic by using DNS to extract data. Also, there are some legitimate software that, I, that are actually using DNS to transfer data because sometimes it's faster than using HTTP or any other network protocol. And no attacker control server is directly contacted because like, there is DNS server that acts as proxy between um, the attacker control server and the victim. So it's a bit like Dropbox or Imgur that, was, that were in the middle. And as a defender, you won't see the full chain. Uh, you, you only see like the first part. Uh, that means that you are not able to, to, to see that an attacker control network resources is contacted by a victim. Um, I will show only one example for that case because most of the um, DNS network protocol used by malware are very similar. So the, my example today is with Invisimal, which is an APT group that is targeting almost exclusively Ukraine. Um, the malware of Invisimal are deployed by another APT group known as Terodo or Gamma. -Rum. So how does it work? A client infected machine will send a DNS request with a hidden message to a Benin DNS server. So you can see uh, 153.re is the uh, uh, domain of the attackers and they will use uh, specific subdomains and this subdomain is generated on the fly because it contains uncredited data. So when uh, the client try to resolve this, uh, this uh, subdomains, it will first contact a Benin, Benin DNS server that will then relay the DNS request to the attacker control name server. But from the defender perspective, you only see the request to the Benin DNS server. Also, uh, in the past few months, there, will, there was like uh, some evolutions with DNS, with the introduction of DNS over HTTPS, which is a new protocol to per perform domain name resolution over HTTPS. And it's by default in Firefox for almost one year. The main advantage for the end user is the encryption and so uh, the increase of, uh, of privacy. But uh, on the Defender perspective, there are some Changes. So, first, to detect CNC communication uh, that use DNS, uh, what I've just shown uh, um, before, uh, you need to actually have visibility on the DNS over HTTPS traffic. And it's the same for resolution of malicious domain, because maybe some of you rely on uh, DNS logs to, to check against the list of non bad, non -bad domain and check if. Uh, some of your machine didn't resolve to, uh, to a known command control server. So it's really important to have visibility on, on this traffic. And otherwise, you'll lose uh, part of the uh, DNS traffic. Some mitigations for the uh, uh, techniques uh, I show. So first, default block of uh, low reputation or uncategorized domain. Uh, it's also, it can also be done through a custom proxy that has a manual confirmation or click to access suspicious domain. So it will break uh, uh, malware that don't implement uh, this, this proxy because they won't be able to, to interact uh, with the proxy and then uh, reach out to, uh, to the, to the con con command and control server. Matthew, uh, four minutes left. Okay. 
Uh, also, uh, limit access to theoretically unused public service in your organization, so it will limit the choices of the attacker. Um, forcing attackers to use public services is quite good because then you can collaborate with security teams of public services. I know that most of them are very responsive. And if you give them a link to, to a malicious Dropbox account or Google Docs account, they will take it down and also end for related, uh, related accounts and block them. So actually, it will like, destroy part of uh, attackers' uh, resources. So attackers are adapting to the impro improvement of detection methods. Um, also, the mail server is a very important asset, asset to protect from unauthorized access, as I show, showed with like Neuron. If your mail server is used as a uh, main uh, point for common control communications, then it's kind of game over, and you can take months or years to, to realize that it's actually compromised. Finally, if some web services are not used, don't hesitate to, to block them. Thanks for your attention and feel free to ask questions. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, it looks like we have one question in the Q&A box uh, from Omar. Interesting presentation. Do you see quick protocol, HTTP 3, being used as a CNC? Uh, no, I never saw that. But I guess that it's a matter of time before some attackers uh, realize that it can be helpful and will start to use it. Uh, generally, they use whatever they can and whatever is available, uh, especially if uh, people don't check it, it's likely that attacker will start. Right, just go ahead. There's another question there about DOH in the wild, malware using the DNS over HTTPS. Uh, so for DOH, uh, I never saw myself a malware use it, but I saw reports of malware that started doing uh, using uh, DNS over HTTP in the wild. So uh, it's a matter of time before uh, there are more and more. And especially if people don't have visibility on it, it's mm -hmm. less likely to, to be catched. So it's really important to have like, uh, visibility on, on this traffic. Maybe we'll do the last two questions here quickly before we uh, end the session. Uh, so mal malware so, using Telegram, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for Telegram, if I remember correctly, there, is, there was the, uh, the uh, uh, Telebots uh, group, which was uh, targeting Ukraine, which, were, which was using Telegram as command control server. And as uh, Telegram is encrypted, it might be a, a bit of a challenge to um, to, to, to uncover suspicious communication, especially if some of your user, users are also using Telegram. Finally, for the uh, TLS SNI field, no, uh, I'm not aware of that, but like I don't know all techniques that are used, and it's possible that some malware are using that. Sorry, I don't have more uh, precise information. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everyone. That's all the time that we have. I know I missed a question here, but uh, feel free to reach out to Matthew. I think he has shared his uh, email address before, or it's probably in his contact, uh, in his profile uh, yes, on the website. Uh, so once again, thank you, Matthew, for the very interesting presentation. Thank you, everybody, and especially for those who ask questions and uh, who joined us uh, tonight or today. Um, and not forgetting also the, for the sponsors who made this event, event possible um, to be accessible to all. So have a good day, good evening, good night. Uh, see you all around. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Go ahead and be ending this session and go ahead and jump on the next session, which will be starting in a couple minutes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good Bye. Night.